Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. This week's conversation features a pair of indie musicians, one of whom is known a bit better for another career, who recently collaborated on a song, and who have lots to say about creativity and the current state of the music biz. Rishikesh Hirway and Melina Duterte, aka J-Song. If you recognize Hirway's name, chances are good it's from one of his popular podcasts. The best known is probably Song Exploder, on which Hirway breaks down a single song by a guest, spending time to get it to component parts and to explore the creative process. Perhaps it goes without saying that it shares some DNA, with the Talkhouse podcast. Song Exploder guests over the years have included Bjork, Spoon, St. Vincent, the list goes on and on. Song Exploder also became a Netflix series in 2020, with Hearway acting as host for the TV version as well. In addition to that, he's behind some other great podcasts, including the fun pandemic-era food chat show Home Cooking, which he co-hosts with Samin Nusrat. With all that on his plate, it's easy to overlook that Hearway spent many years making gentle, melancholy indie music under the name The 1AM Radio. That part of his life took a backseat to his other pursuits, but music called him back, and he spent some time over the pandemic recording songs that he's slowly releasing under his own name. The first was a collaboration with famed cellist Yo-Yo Ma, and just this week came the second, a collaboration with today's other guest, Melina Duterte, who's better known by her project's name, j The two met because Duterte was a guest on Song Exploder, where she spoke about her song Tenderness. Though he didn't actually host that episode, Hirway loved what he heard, and the two struck up a friendship that led to Duterte guesting on the song Home. Check out a little bit of that team up here. Of some new dream No more living in between All the time that's passed On streets we knew And windows that I've seen you through If you like what you hear, check out the rest of Hearway's EP, which is coming out later this year, as well as the JSOM catalog, which is thoroughly fantastic. Her last album under the name was 2019's Anak Ko, but she spent time producing and collaborating with other folks over the past couple of years, including production duties for the latest album by Julia Shapiro of Chastity Belt, who was also a recent guest on this very podcast. JSOM's music is often called bedroom pop, but after people hear this conversation, they may have to start calling it attic pop, since Duterte recently relocated to a private top floor of her own. Elsewhere in this conversation, she and Hearway talk about the hot mess that is the music industry, the software they sometimes use, and the alt-rock band that Duterte obsessed over as a preteen. Enjoy. Hi, Rishi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. I took a shower. Uh, (laughs) I'm having some Earl Grey black tea. I put some, like, mushroom powder in it just to try it out. What does that do? Not like shrooms, right? Just right. like yeah, <laughs> just like you know, like the the kind that's like mixed with cacao and stuff. Yeah. Does it taste good? It tastes like mushrooms, which I I like, but apparently it helps with like mood, and you know makes you focus more. So I like. So mushrooms. you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with you? How are you? I'm good. I've I've been um I've been thinking about you a lot because I've been you know oh. working on uh, working on the video for for our song together yeah so i've been thinking about you and thinking about your voice which of course i did a lot of anyway before i asked you to be on the song but your voice and your music go so well together like i i can't imagine music that you would make that would sound different does the music that you make sound the way that it does because of the way that you hear your own voice or do you think that like you would make that music no matter what or if you could choose your voice, would it sound different from the voice that you have? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a good question. Well, first of all, thank you for the kind words. I do agree that my voice kind of goes hand in hand with my music. I also don't personally see my voice like in anything else, but I do get asked to do like pop songs sometimes. And it kind of confuses me because I don't really consider myself a singer. So <laughs> every time I get like asked to do these like features or things like that, I'm like really honored and really happy that I'm like thought of but I'm also like really self-deprecating when it comes to 
my voice because I I don't think that's like uh, like a strength of mine, and I I feel like with my <laughs> own music, I uh, try to treat it as like an instrument, and that's why it's like really low in the you know in the mix because yeah. I'm the one that's also mixing it and like engineering it. I can understand that kind of feeling, but but from my perspective, that is a, a you know. <laughs> I'm just going to say that's a ridiculous thing to feel about your voice. It's so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. But I do like singing. And um, I think if if I could, I'd want to be really good at like, y- you know how really good singers can do those like vocal runs? Oh, yeah. They're like, ah. Yes. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't understand that. Like, I can't, you know, <laughs> it's in my mind, but I can't yeah. like, execute it. I feel like I'd want to do that. And that's like, you know, really popular and like pop music and R&B. Yeah. What about you? I think about this a lot because I always want to try different things. And, and, um, I think that I've settled into the idea that I try and aim for what I can do. You know, like I I don't have a voice that can do 10,000 different things. Like I can't sound like a chameleon. And I think Mm -hmm. I've, I'm like, okay, this, so what I would like to make is, is much broader, I think, than what I, what I end up making and, and the way that I end up making music i think i try and fit it to my voice like it feels a little bit like uh yeah it feels a little bit like a crutch in some ways i feel like that's also like connected to the fact that that's your style too and you're trying to lean into it and not so much like a crutch i used to think that style was completely just you know all choice it was all just oh this person's doing this because they want to do this i realized that sometimes or not sometimes pretty much all cases you're you're having to work with like what you've got, you know, you're the, (laughs) you're the limiting factor in, in anything that you want to make. Have you been like thinking about that kind of lately because of the the EP and, you know, I I've wanted to ask like what your process is like navigating all of this because you've been doing like your podcast song exploder and you've been doing so much like press too. And now you're doing like photo shoots and the music (laughs) video and stuff. Like I, I feel like the last time I saw you, you were kind of like juggling all of that. Yeah. So how's it been? It's been a lot. I like doing a lot of different things at the same time, which is also something that can get me in trouble because, because it's very easy for it to tip from, um, a lot of things (laughs) that's manageable to a lot of things and it's not manageable. Mm-hmm. I think if I were more of a focused person and I was like, I'm just going to do this one thing and just like really concentrate on it for, for the next year, then I might be more productive and I might be able to like <laughs> manage my time better. But, but I just, uh, I can feel my heart being pulled in like four different directions yeah. at once, um, all the time. And, and I feel happy when I get to do that, when I get and can be like, okay, spent, you know, a few hours on that or spent yeah. one day on that. And the next day is going to be a little different, but I think I'm just, I'm just really happy that a big chunk of my time is now being spent on music again. Cause it, for a long time it wasn't for like a couple of years. Right. Y- y- like, I mean th- this new stuff, um, it comes out, you know, it's 10 years since my last full length oh came gosh. out. Wow. You're in a really long break now. Yeah, I am like a two year break. Yeah. And I think last time I talked to you when, when we did our photos for, uh, for, for the song, you said you were enjoying having the break. I, I was feeling I anxious it. on your behalf, but <laughs> you were. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess I don't feel the pressure. I feel the same way as you. I think like it, it's really feels really good to do music. And there's a certain like, I don't know, like special quality that you feel when you're like involved in all the moving parts that, you know, the music that you do. But I think I didn't even do it for a long time. I, I guess I started like, 2015 and you know I did the touring for five years and got signed to a label I think I I just kind of got not burnt out I I was just tired and I I needed a break yeah and I I just wasn't finding like meaning in writing my own music it didn't feel right Uh, especially when the pandemic uh, happened you know throughout these two years I, I, I spent a lot of like focusing that energy on like helping other people i've been really into like engineering and mixing people's projects and wearing a producer cap because i just i think i'm just really tired of thinking about myself all the time (laughs) and it feels good to have that in you know someone else's project yeah 
I'm really excited to be done with the, this EP <laughs> that I'm working on and think about something else for a second. It does start, yeah. start to feel like really self-absorbed. Yeah, you and, have like the stories that you yeah. have to like talk about all the time and repeat yourself. <laughs> yeah. But until that's over, I'm uh, you know, until this conversation's over, I am going to make you think about yourself. <laughs> oh, thank you. And talk about yourself. I love the music video, by the way. I know you sent it to me like right before this, but I got yeah, to watch it. Oh, you it, got to it's watch so it? so beautiful. Am I allowed to talk about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I really love it. I think just like, I just love the concept of, you know, older people showing their love and like the older pictures. It's really tugging at my heart. Oh, good. Um, and I, I'm yeah. so glad that you were in it, even though you were out of town when, when we shot it. Yeah. Thank you for including the, that picture. I love that picture of me and Annie. I love that picture too. I was like, "Oh, if you're not here, what can I get?" Yeah, it looked like a it looked like a print. Yeah, I actually did. I printed it out. Oh wow! Okay, I downloaded that's the why. photo of the two of you and and made a print, and then and so then that's like the photo, the camera filming me holding the photo of the two of you. What was it like <laughs> doing the music video? It was a pretty mellow day, but it was definitely mm -hmm. a little nerve wracking to like direct a video. Um, mm. That was, but. I get excited about getting to try new things, and um, and that was that was pretty exciting. Have you done that before, like music videos? I directed the video for my song that came up before this, but it was yeah. all animated, and I worked with you know three animators, one of whom co-directed the video with me. So that was pretty different than than something like this, where it was like there was a crew and the people came to the set. There was a set. Mm -hmm. We had to have like covid um like safety procedures in yeah. place everywhere you know all that stuff but it was it was nice it was like a nice hard thing that i you know felt like i got to do something new when was the last time you yeah. felt that way that, that there was something that you you had not done before like ever in your life and then and then you got to try it i guess the last time i was like really shocked by an opportunity was like vogue I think like Teen Vogue or something. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the being in like the indie music world, you, you know, you make your songs and you record them, but there's also like the press part of it. And I think that was really shocking to me um, to sort of be involved in like, you know, this model world. When did you decide that you were going to make music, you know, full time? Like, when did you decide, like, this is what I want to do? Oh, boy. I think it was out of necessity when I was a, a teenager. My family didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't really get to go to college. I went to community college. Uh, but my plan was that I really wanted to continue my studies with jazz trumpet. Mm -hmm. I wanted to like go to this jazz school in Berkeley, California, or like somewhere else, like a conservatory in San Francisco for something. But that didn't work out because I, I was just like working a lot and, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I was really focused on getting better at music and recording. And that's why I joined this community college to kind of take some programs and learn Pro Tools and like Cubase and all these things. And I was learning Logic. I think that was the moment where I was like, I, I just want to do this. I think this is my calling. Like, I love it. I'm like focused. I'm having fun. I'm meeting people that I like. And... I think shortly after that, I released this song called I Think You're All Right. Mm -hmm. And I love that song. Released it with like Fat Possum and things sort of started like gaining traction. And I released this like uh, album called Turn Into and I released it like randomly on Bandcamp. And it started from there that I, you know, started to get some sort of like success. And yeah, I think that I, I just, I just knew that that was like my course in life. I feel like there must have been some steps though between I, I want to focus more on jazz trumpet and then like <laughs> learning Cubase and then mm -hmm. writing, I think you're all right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were the steps in between? Because how do you go from, from, you know, I think of like jazz trumpet. I mean, I grew up in Massachusetts, so I knew a lot of people who went to Berkeley School of Music. And yeah. I think about like sort of like the rigor and the discipline of like, you know, you play your instrument hours and hours and hours a day. I'm just wondering how, how you go from, from jazz trumpet to like writing this beautiful hooky indie pop song. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm leaving out a chunk of my history, which is, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> do you remember a dog called Sony acid music studio? No, I, ne I never used that oh or, or heard of it. I think when I was like 12, my dad brought me to guitar center and he knew that I was like really into music at the time. Like my parents bought me this like 
really cute guitar and I was learning like the yeah yeah yeahs and stuff like that because I was obsessed with Karen O and I really wanted to record myself because I had this like webcam mic that I kept using for my dad's um, computer and it was like so bad and he just wanted me to like have something <laughs> nice for a second yeah. uh, and he brought me to Guitar Center and he bought this package that was Sony Acid Music Studio and a USB microphone that was like terrible that would always cut out <laughs> and that was like my first experience with like a DAW and at the same time I was learning Audacity which is like so old I use Audacity all the time really you still use yeah. it yeah because oh it's gosh. just it's so it's so easy and and quick you know yeah is it updated yeah they still update it I mean actually it updated for so long it looked like it was made in 1998 and, yeah. and you know <laughs> for decades it still looked like that but when i got a new computer a few years ago i downloaded it again and and they had a new version that looks a little more like contemporary yeah but i tell people to get audacity all the time because you know when i'm talking to people who are starting podcasts mm -hmm. um and they're like oh what software should i use and i was like well before you spend any money on anything you can just download audacity and and try and yeah, work off free. that because it's free yeah, yeah, and it's on both Mac and PC. Oh my gosh, I should open it back up. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, when I'm listening back to mixes, I'll bring it into Audacity mm -hmm. because then I can look at the waveform and you can get, you know, um, very close as opposed to looking at it on like iTunes or something where you can't get milliseconds oh, and things like that. Yeah. You know, you can do that, but you also don't have to, you know, open up a whole Pro Tools session and create a whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. I can just put it in audacity and, and listen to it there i guess i wanted to ask too just how did your music background and you know the song exploder podcast like how did that all coexist and kind of meet the last album that i put out it was under the name the 1am radio mm -hmm. um which was the name that i used from from when i was in college basically until i decided with this ep that i wasn't going to use that name and that i was going to put it out under my own name and so the last 1am radio record came out in 2011 and then I was kind of, I felt like a little bit stuck, mm -hmm. um, or not a little bit, I felt completely stuck and uh, I didn't know what was going to happen next. I, I, I guess like I was looking at the idea of, okay, well, my touring cycle ended and I kind of wanted more from the record. I felt like I had certain expectations and I didn't meet those expectations. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of bummed. And so I wasn't like excited about the idea of like, hey, let's go write a, a whole new set of songs. And it took me a really long time to make that record. You know, it like between my first and second record, it was like two two years. And then between mm -hmm. my second and my third record, it was three years. And then between the oh, wow. third and the fourth record, it was four years. <laughs> and so I was like, oh God, it's gonna yeah, take Yeah, that's actually so a chunk long. of time. Yeah, I worked really slowly. Mm -hmm. So I was a little nervous about the idea of spending a whole huge chunk of my life focused on that and then doing something and then in the end feeling disappointed again. So sort of for the first time in my life, I was like, let me see what other things are in my brain and pursue some of them and just put music on hold for a second. Yeah. Just, just for a second. That was what I thought, you know, mm -hmm. and song exploder had been this idea that I'd carried around for, for a little while. You know, just thinking about all the conversations that I used to have with friends of mine you know a friend of mine would put out a song that was great and i would have all these questions about like oh, how did you do that and what does that sound you know and because yeah. i love what they did yeah. and i w listened to it so intently and then sometimes i'd get to go over to their house and see their session or whatever or or sometimes i would do remixes for people yeah and then there's that great moment when you get the stems for someone else's song oh i love and that. you go through yeah. all the stems <laughs> you, you know you, and you it's like listening solo. to the song yeah. Yeah, yeah in a whole new way you're like oh wow that's what's happening mm -hmm. and i feel like it's really it's really exciting because you get to fall in love with their song in a new way and mm -hmm. it also it's supposed to be this this springboard for your own creativity yeah. um so i really loved loved that moment of just like getting to hear other people's stuff and i was thinking about how you know when you put out a song you put out and put in all this work and you think about all these things and then and then you just put it out and and you know especially now nobody reads liner notes or anything like that there's no way to say hey this is what i was thinking about or this is what i was trying to do so anyway so that that was sort of where it all kind of came from and then in 2013 that was when i was like okay i'm gonna take a break for a second and instead of just going back into the next album whatever 
I'm going to, maybe I'll, I'll see what this is like and, and see if, uh, if this could be cool. And look at you now. It's, it's so amazing. I think what you're doing is really special and cool and I don't see anyone else doing it. And I remember talking to my partner about this, but when we saw the, uh, the Netflix special too, I was like, gosh, that's like so amazing that, you know, it's on this level now. It's not just a podcast. Thanks a lot. Yeah. My relationship with the show has kind of changed over the over the years because at first I was really excited about it and um, and it was like it was the thing that I was doing it and I, cr- I tried to put as much passion into it as I did yeah. my own music you know it felt like doing remixes in a way mm-hmm. where I was like oh yeah I'm working with somebody else's stems but instead of remixing it into a song I was remixing it into like trying to tell their story but then like after a bunch of years of doing it I started to get sad and I couldn't quite figure it out. Yeah. And then, um, and then eventually I realized that like, I was really missing making music Yeah, and I was spending so much time on the podcast because it had become this thing instead of spending four years, you know, trying to like finish one album. It was like, Oh, you just make episodes, make episodes, make episodes. You know, I could just put it out, you know, it was like an easier way to kind of cross things off of a checklist. Yeah. I ended up doing that and prioritizing it over like, well, let me sit down and write a song and maybe that's going to take months to finish. Yeah. Um, instead I can do this thing that will take me two weeks to finish. And so then I got really, I got really bummed and sad about just like how my own music had kind of disappeared from my own life. You know, like it was supposed to be the oh. song exploder was, was the hobby. Yeah. And then, I, um, and then suddenly it like grew into something that took up more and more of my life. And so then I was like, well, how, how does this work? Like, I just felt like either I had to, I had to just quit the podcast and go, go back to making music altogether or quit making music in order to do this thing. And I was really resentful about uh, that whole idea. Yeah. But now I'm in this other place with it because what I ended up deciding after the Netflix thing was all done and, and I knew I was going to just be making the podcast again, I was like, okay, I'm just going to, I have to figure out a way to make music a part of my life again. Yeah. I think I had this idea that like creativity is this thing that like floats in the air and you have to just (laughs) be available at all times to catch it with your antenna (laughs) and you can't schedule it. But then, but like I was basically desperate. And so I said, well, maybe at least I can try to schedule it and maybe it won't work Mm -hmm. most of the time, but at least, but at least let me try. So, so then I, I decided I was like, okay, at least one day a week, every week, I'm going to, I'm just going to focus on making music. And so last year, that's, that's what I started doing. Yeah. And I also, the other big change I made was to try and like write with other people and collaborate with other people in different ways. And so that's, I'm like so grateful that you did Song Exploder because, because it gave me a chance to meet you, even though I wasn't there (laughs) because I think I was filming Netflix stuff. Yeah. But still I got to, you know, got to decide to have you on the show and I got to work on your episode. So I had this relationship with your song and your interview, even though we didn't actually meet. I love that interview. That was so fun. It was. Yeah. And the song is so great. You did your episode about tenderness, which I love. Anyway, now I feel like really grateful for the podcast because it's given me the chance to meet people, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people and, and talk to people. And, and now some of that's played into things like, you know, the fact that you sang on this song that you lent your voice to, to the song thank you for asking me i'm grateful too i i really really am and i really respect you a lot i think you're so talented and hardworking, and what you're doing is special He's but yeah speaking of collaborations <laughs> tell me about like you know john congleton and and also like i'm really curious because you said you know you haven't made or or you took a break in 2013 uh, yeah. Like the state of the music industry is like so much different. So I like really am interested in, you know, how you view it and like, what's your opinion in the way that the music industry works right now? It's not like when I stopped making music where I was like full time, you know, making music and touring. That was the way that I was trying to like make my living. And I was trying to not to have a day job. I just wanted to just make music. Yeah. But now I, I have a day job, which is doing different podcasts and different non, you know, whatever weird projects that I'm doing. And so I can think about making music a little bit more the way, like the way that I used to think about it when I first started, which is that I just, I just am happy to be doing it. And that's helped me kind of de-stress a little bit about the utter garbage state of the music industry (laughs) right now. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. (laughs) It's so confusing. (laughs) Yeah. 
How are you feeling about the music industry? Oh, so depressed. Uh, <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of like posts lately um, about how hard it is to navigate being an artist and what what is it? What is it? Like, what does it mean to be um, a successful artist? What does it mean to be like an indie artist? Um, yeah. What does it mean to have, I don't know, be a content creator and how it ties into your brand or you know quote unquote oh i know i hate saying those words because that's what it feels like i'm not very active on social media because of that i feel ill when i post <laughs> about myself two times a day you know what about yeah. you uh i admire your your social media restraint i'm a little too <laughs> addicted to it i will scroll instagram and twitter too much like yeah. in moments when i'm ought to be you know, meditative or, or thinking about something. Cause those are the moments when you actually can come up with ideas and like come up with things that might lead to songs and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I started putting a limit on my phone. Oh, okay. Wait, does it like stop your phone? I've never used that before. Like, what does it do? It just uh, like a screen comes up and it says you've hit your daily limit for, you know, for this app. So then you, you say, okay. And it, and it closes the app. But of course it also gives the option to like ignore that. <laughs> and so. <laughs> That's the thing. It's not I mean, like it's a lot. Of no, it's not. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. I, you know, I, I don't think that there's ever been a time in my life when um, people have ever said anything good about the music industry. I think after Napster, people were like, well, there, you know, basically the music industry was in a state of decline, has been in a state of decline the entire time that I've been in it. <laughs> yes. A and people talked about it 10 years ago and it was terrible. And yet somehow 10 yeah. years ago was better than it is now. <laughs> It, it seems like being talented or, you know, good at what you do doesn't matter anymore. You need to have something and, you know, you need to have that like 30 second like TikTok clip uh, yeah. with a dance that goes viral. <laughs> or you need to have like a really sad story, something like that. You, you can't just make music. I feel like that's kind of always been the case is that you need to like are the artists that really broke weren't just people who made great music, but they were, they had great music and a great story nice. cookie to their identity. There was something that like people were excited to talk about. And so that yeah. really like helped them. Um, I don't know. I'm not jaded, but I'm like, <laughs> 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 I'm just like grumpy when it comes to the music industry. Like a yeah. lot of people are, I think that's why, but there are a lot of positive things out of it. And I think, being like a solo musician, I've met so many good people and I've toured with so many good people and like artists and I've made really special connections and the best parts of those friendships um, are like talking about what's going on and like asking each other questions. And, you know, I've had those conversations with you too, where it's like, how, how are you navigating doing all of this stuff? Cause I, I've been there before. Yeah. And I know what it feels like. I feel like there's an, an like an entire class of people who make music have just decided to comp compartmentalize uh, our feelings about the industry and, um, and just keep going. And it's really, really hard to, um, make any kind of living off of your art in this way. But, um, mm -hmm. but it's not stopping people from making music. Yeah. This is how it is. Like the, um, you know, the album cycle, thinking about music and album cycles. All right, I got two months to make this record, and then in six months, the vinyl's going to come out, and then in a year, I'm going to do the tour around it for the next two years, and then I'm going to do my album next year. You know what I'm saying? I do respect people that can sort of think like that, and I think that comes with, you know, a lot of hard work and really wanting something, and if people want to do that, that's okay. I think a lot about the, the, the idea of, like, a middle middle class of mu musicianship, hmm. like being, that was sort of always my goal. I just wanted to be able to live and make music. Like, can you make music and not try and be like, oh yeah, some international superstar, platinum charting, whatever, but just like, can I just make a living? Can I just pay my bills and, yeah. and um, be a person? I guess I, I feel like in, <laughs> to be like super old man sounding, um, but you know, I felt like in the nineties, there were a lot of small bands that where it was like, people could just live and like, they paid their bills and they, they toured mm -hmm. like the kind of bands that would play like 500 person rooms. Yeah. They would like com have a comfortable life being full-time musicians. Wow. And I just, I and even. I don't feel like that. 
that hasn't existed in a long time, but I really no. feel like it doesn't exist now, you know, and they, they could exist based on like selling rec, like actually selling records. And that whole thing has just kind of gone away. It's weird. It's yeah. like, you, you like people have to um, rely on some level of like charity, I think from their fans of yeah. people saying like, ah, oh, I'm going to buy your vinyl. You know, I'm never, I, I might not listen to it on vinyl, but I want to have it because I, I like the, art and i want to support you you know there's this feeling mm-hmm. of like i want to support my artist and it really felt like you had to do that like if you stretch far enough back you supported the artists you loved by like engaging with their music because it it costs money to buy their records i know if it's going to come back yeah now we can just see them on youtube or spotify just yeah. listen to one single <laughs> <laughs> here's my actual theory on that i don't know that it could ever happen but i think if there could be a, a way where streaming services became so ubiquitous that like every mm. single person was just you know subscribing and every single person kind of um subscribed at a level of like a subscription you know even if it wasn't a very expensive subscription mm-hmm. that there would be sort of more more money collectively in a pool for the people who made make music and so yeah. you know basically the value of a stream would have to go up i think for 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 that to kind of come back yeah not point zero 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 one <laughs> cents yeah exactly <laughs> a song yeah. yeah yeah no you're right that's literally it yeah Ooh. when was the last time that you had a um had a non-music related job i felt really lucky that i've gotten to pretty much focus on anything music related since like 2016 and mm-hmm. before that uh right out of in high school and out of high school, I was working for, you know, lots of sandwich shops, sandwich and like cafe shops, getting my foot in the door of like the food service industry. And it was really hard. And I'm so grateful that I was in it uh, for as long as I was. I was like working every single day, even in the weekends, yeah. just yeah. so I can like eat and do music on the side. Yeah. And I think if I didn't have those experiences, I wouldn't be who I am today because I think that. I learned a lot of like my own work ethic and, you know, the kind of people I want to work with, how to talk to people, how to be kind. Uh, and I think a lot of people that work in service feel the same way. Um, yeah. 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 What about you? I, I worked at McDonald's in high school. That was my, Ooh. yeah, that was yeah. my, um, my time. It was not, not a fam- not a small family. <laughs> in Massachusetts? Owned, in Massachusetts. Yeah. Where in Massachusetts are you from? I'm from Peabody and um, the the uh which is north of boston it's about about okay. 20, 20 miles 20, 20 minutes or so north of boston is it pretty small over there like a small community it was a city it was yeah. it was you know a city of about i think at the time when i lived there it was around like 220,000 people something like that mm-hmm. you know we had our own mall <laughs> i i didn't yeah. work at the mcdonald's at our mall i worked at the mcdonald's at the next neighboring town's mall <laughs> um oh, cool. but, but we also had a mall of our own Awesome. <laughs> what was that? Did you did you go to like shows a lot? Not a ton. I went to some sort of like DIY, you know, Knights of Columbus kind of um, punk shows. Mm-hmm. But I started doing going to more of those shows in college when I would actually be like playing those shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't go to a ton of shows in in high school. I kind of feel like I didn't really like understand how music worked in terms of like being something that you could actually do Mm -hmm. you know my only sense of what it meant to perform music was in school you know doing like school concerts or 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 things like that or even if you were gonna be in a band and play a show it would be like through the school (laughs) really (laughs) Um, yeah yeah yeah. and it was only when i went to college and i and i met met some friends who, who were playing music and we you know we bonded over over music and like punk rock and stuff like that. And they, they would be like, Hey, we have a, you were playing a show at this venue. And then I would, and I started going to shows and then I started playing shows. I was a late bloomer. (laughs) That's okay. That's cool. I didn't really know that like you could be in a band like on a small scale and have it still feel real. Like I didn't know you could do that. This idea of like middle-class musicianship. I didn't know that was something that even existed until after I graduated college. Yeah. Um, cause like the people who I was friends with, nobody had any kind of career ambitions. I just thought like I wanted to do it, but I just, I had no idea how to do it in any way other than just as a hobby until I was actually doing it. Like it was only after mm-hmm. I did my first longer tour that I was like, 
okay, I can see how this could be a thing and I want to, and I yeah. want to do that thing. It like changes your life when you meet those people that are doing, yeah. are doing it. Like something that lived in your mind and you're like, wow, I want to be them. They're my hero. Yeah. Who, who, who is your hero? Did you have like a early music hero? I mean... I feel like I, met, I just mentioned her, but Karen O from Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I've been listening to her since I was like eight years old. I didn't really get to grow up and see like people that look, look, look like me. And I think, yeah. You know, the fact yeah. that she's like Korean American was really cool. And she's like this powerhouse of a front woman. Yeah. You know, on stage was like really awesome in like the early 2000s. But um, in terms of heroes, I think. My heroes were just the people I was listening to. I was like so obsessed with just going to Barnes and Noble and buying CDs and like the alternative rock section and, you know, being obsessed with these people and like just thinking like, how do they do this? Like, I want to do it. It's so cool. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. This goes back to my first question, right? So about like, about the music that you make fitting the the sound of your own voice. Mm -hmm. Like what, who was the person in that era, because I feel like everybody kind of does this at the beginning. You're, you're basically kind of trying to rip off your heroes a little bit. Oh, yeah, of course. So who was the hero that you were trying to rip off that you think led to you? 100% Death Cab for Cutie. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's so I love cool. Uh, and, and I love that band. They they mean so much to me. My favorite <laughs> record is We Have the Facts and We're Voting Yes. I'm really excited that that's what you said, because I just saw, you know, one of your rare social media posts. <laughs> Oh yeah, the Yoko Ono. That you're ono. doing this Yoko yeah. ono, ono tribute and, and Ben yeah. Gibbard curated that. Yeah, yeah. Have you had lots of ex- interactions with them before or was that your first, like, was that really special for you? Every interaction with him is special. I've had a couple now. Um, I played a show with him in like Cleveland, talked to Ben a couple times and every time I'm like, this is awesome. He's just so nice. Um And sometimes I feel like maybe like a part of me is blacking out like my 10 year old self Uh, (laughs) because like I used to sit, you know, in my childhood bedroom, just listening to all of their albums, you know, being really emo. And uh, (laughs) also when I started recording, I used to do this thing where I would take like Death Cab for Cutie tracks and I take the whole like file of the song and then I'd Mm -hmm. make my own versions on top of it and then like mute the you know yeah yeah the, yeah the original song and just like have it be this cover and it's like so out of time and it sounds bad that's great though that's such a good exercise yeah. it's like you're like tracing and coloring on top of a picture and then you take the the original picture away yeah i think that's one of the best ways to practice is to literally just practice to songs that you love with bass i love playing bass and it's like you just play along to like 70s funk records yeah you'll be good yeah I hadn't thought about that in a while, but that's how I learned how to play the drums. I used to listen to 13 songs by Fugazi and um, and the self-titled Helmet CD, or these, yeah. were, I, they, these weren't CDs, these were cassettes. I had them, I had, you know, taped them and I would, and I would sit with the Walkman and um, put the headphones on and just try and play along because I knew the song so well. I feel like that's like a classic drummer move too. Like yeah. just always playing along to things. I love right. watching YouTube drum covers. I've never gone down that rabbit hole. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think lots I feel of like fills. That's what I'm yeah, gonna do. drummers yeah. love doing fills and covers. <laughs> I wanted to ask before too, just like the subject matter of home, you know, and why you picked it as your single. Oh, I know yeah. that it's kind of like it's dedicated to your wife and you know the new home that you moved into. Yeah. Well, you know when when I wrote it, we we're living in our old home but that's the second place where we had lived we we used to live in a one bedroom place that i had lived in before before um, my wife Lindsay and i met she when we, when we got together she moved in with me and then and then we moved into this little two bedroom house later we'd been together at that point for over 10 years wow but also uh you know it had been a weird it was in the pandemic that i that i wrote that and so we were spending so much time together I mean, 24 hours a day. <laughs> and I was really grateful to, our, our, like our house, the place where we lived was so small. It was really small. And it was hard because anytime anybody would come over, we, like we, it was too small for us to really have visitors. You know, there's only mm-hmm. like one bathroom and it's in the middle of the house. It could feel a little tight sometimes. But then when, um, when the pandemic hit and it was just us, 
it actually felt really, really comfortable. It was like the perfect mm -hmm. space for, for just us. And I know pe so many people had such a hard time and I was extremely, I felt very, very lucky that for us, we were able to go and like get to a place where we just it, like things felt like a little cocoon like it was just sort of just us in the house and that's it yeah and in that time also my mom passed away and that was you know that was the first person that i'd ever lost that was that was close to me i was lucky to have that experience so late but um um as opposed to like Lindsay, who she lost her dad before we ever met mm -hmm. um when she when mm -hmm. she was pretty young and so I was thinking about, I was thinking about all these feelings kind of mixing together at that, that gratitude and that feeling of like comfort, but also just, uh, like how being in that house and being with her had kind of carried me through this, like these sad months, you know, um, my mom yeah. had been sick for a very, very long time, um, before she passed away. And, uh, and, and I don't know, I was thinking about the place where we lived, you know, I remember I will always forget, like, just getting the call from my sister. I was away. You know, my, my family lives on the East Coast still. Mm -hmm. And and getting the call from my sister when, my, my, um, you know, the ambulance, ambulance had come. She had called me and she was like, you know, I was like, is everything okay? She was like, no. Anyway, I remember just being in the house. I remember where I was sitting. Mm -hmm. I was w on the phone with my mom and my sister, you know, when, when, when they were at, they went to the hospital and we were waiting. And then, like, the... um doctor came in and told us that she was gone and and i was just thinking like that space that physical space of that house like that is a in, indelible part of that moment mm -hmm. in my life now like my part of my history and Lindsay was sitting right next to me and she had her, mm -hmm. her arm around me and so i was thinking about how like that's just that's a part of that house now my life in that mm -hmm. house and and the house is part of my life in in that way and at the same time we had been yeah we'd been thinking about like are we going to move somewhere else? Are we going to try and move someplace that, that doesn't feel quite as cramped or whatever? And I was thinking about how sad I would be about the idea of like this incredibly formative, even though it was sad, this inc incredibly um, important moment in my life, I would be leaving that space behind. Yeah. And then I started thinking about all the other things, you know, like all the other things that we'd be leaving behind in terms of memories that happened in that house. And then I started thinking about the first place we lived and all the memories that like we still carried with us. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm so sorry about your mom. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's such a, like, it's a really beautiful song, and I think that a lot of people can relate to that, and sort of how, yeah, the physical spaces are so important to us as humans, and how we carry grief um, in, like, a physical sense, too. Yeah, yeah. How have you been liking um, your your home and your home <laughs> studio? I feel like it, you've got it. It's like it, just seeing it on camera right now, you know, it yeah. looks so beautifully dialed in. Everything looks like it's in its right place. Thank you. Yeah, it kind of looks like a tunnel sometimes. But yeah, it's my little <laughs> attic, which is rare for L.A. to have attics. Yeah. Yeah. I was so shocked. But um, yeah, I'm in Atwater. I've been living here now for more than a year now. Maybe a year and a half. But the, the entire time you've lived there, it's been pandemic times. Yeah. Yeah. I moved yeah. in here in like June. And this is the first time I've had a separate studio space. And this attic has been like really serving me well because it's it's tiny, but um, I could fit all of my stuff in here. And um, it's really great for like one or two people if they want to come mix and record. And I've been making a lot of like really beautiful memories up here with people. That's awesome. Wait, and but it's your space. Does does your partner have her own separate space too? Does she ever come up there and like work on work on <laughs> <laughs> work up there with you? No, she doesn't. We we actually have this funny thing right now where uh, sometimes she'll like come up to just be like, "Hi, what are you doing?" And I'm like, "I'm working." <laughs> <laughs> so that's like the only thing we're fighting about right now. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Annie, if you hear this, uh, but <laughs> it's really cute. It's it's pretty funny, but um. But no, no, she usually, if she does music stuff, it's in our room and she has her little office now because she's studying and in school now to become an acupuncturist. So oh, cool. we're very like separate now and I can have my, you know, eight to 10 hours in the attic and be by myself. Uh, but we do have a roommate too. Um, but it's, it's a music house and 
this guy, I won't say his name, but he's a very prominent rock and roll guy, uh, lives in the back house and he just has the craziest like hours, like from 12 to 6 a.m. just does karaoke. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear it from inside the house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes it's a little like complicated for, you know, recording. But I feel yeah. like we all have this unspoken agreement that we can be loud and like the neighborhood doesn't really care, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I feel really, really lucky to be here and to be able to do my job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope I hope someday, <laughs> someday we'll, I'll be able to come over and we can hang out in person there. Yeah. I would love to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the meantime, it's been so nice to get to talk to you. I mean, I know we made this entire song without actually <laughs> being uh, together in person, but, yeah. um, but it's been so nice to get to know you better through music. I feel the same way. Thank you so much again for asking me. And I'm, I'm so like happy to be your friend now and to <laughs> work too. this way. And uh, thank you for talking to me for an hour. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast, and thanks to Rishikesh Hirway and Melina Duterte for chatting. Check out their collaborative song, Home, and be sure to follow them both, and Talk House, on your favorite social media channels. This week's episode was produced by Melissa Kaplan, and the Talk House theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time. <laughs>